Well, Happy New Year, Church. It's so good to be with you this morning, and I asked Nate to join me again. Uh, we're going to be, I don't know how long, on lockdown, but now we are in 2021. So, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> happy New Year to everyone. And we believe that this next year is going to be the year of hope. And you see on the screen, 2021, the year of hope, and we need to hear a message about hope uh, because uh, last year was pretty hard. Yeah, just with the whole lockdown and people were just really not used to living inside the whole time. At least most people um, being socially isolated, having to kind of compensate for the lack of community. Mm -hmm. um, it presented a lot of challenges, especially for discipleship. Um, community in, in the church together um, and so we're going to look and see what this year is going to have for us but we need to understand this very important thing that the bible wants us to know 2012 you know you switch the last two numbers i remember there was a big huge uh i don't know everyone was saying the world was coming to an end because the mayan calendar there it is was running out at 2012. So everyone was like, oh, definitely something's going to happen in this world. That was the year of my high school graduation, by the way. <laughs> so I, I and didn't I have, take my grades as well as I probably should. And you survived. We're still here. The, your, your world did not end. It did not. Okay. Uh, my grades might have, <laughs> you know, a few of them gone to an end, but I think we're okay. And a lot of people are kind of nervous about the COVID uh, situation as well and now we're probably going to be on lockdown again here in Thailand uh, but many people are always uh, saying that this is going to be the worst everyone's hoping to get out of 2020 and 2021 to be much better um, but there are a lot of doomsday people out there and they need to hear like we need to hear confirmation before God that there is hope there's a distinguishing thing between believers and non-believers, and that is hope. Hope is one of the major beacons of light that the, the Church of Christ holds up, um, that people, when they see that, they go, I need to know. And what's the explanation for the why they have the attitude that they have? So, so many people thought the end of the world by a solar flare, or possibly the end of the world by... Planet X knocking into the Earth, or you've, we've seen lots of movies about this one, the, you know, the meteor that hits the Earth, and it's an extinction event. I like those movies. We just saw Greenland. <laughs> it was pretty good, and so I just recommend that for you guys. Or a super volcano, or the Earth's magnetic polarization shift is going to cause everything to go crazy, and we're all going to just fall off the Earth. Or this uh, this magnetosphere, you know how the, the, it's going to take out all of that protection from the sun, and we're all going to melt. <laughs> uh, or the great earthquake, yeah, the big one. Yeah. It's going to just like destroy the whole everything. Um, and we have the tsunami, and possibly nuclear, uh, you know, energy disaster, like we saw in Chernobyl, or. You guys, you, what, 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 sloppy with the thing? Two or Ukraine? Yeah, no, I mean the one in Japan. Oh. Uh, you can lock, 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 that, know, sure. that one. Sure. Or nuclear fallout from the explosions of nuclear bombs. I mean, it just goes on. Ozone layer. I mean, they believe in that it's going to tear apart so we won't be able to breathe anymore. Global warming or global whatever that might be as well. And here's a funny little cartoon that says the end is near or the end is far and the guy who's holding the one that says the end is near is when looks at the other guy and says you're whack wacko of course everybody thinks the end is near maybe even Godzilla <clears throat> we don't know we don't know there's just no. so many ways yeah but here's the deal um, we have been going through some hard times and, and I think all of us need to hear a message of hope um, mothers have been struggling we've gone through uh, at these different Bible studies that we have and they're having difficulties in their relationship with children uh, feeling sometimes some unappreciated some of them feel uh, not cared for 
Uh, we have some that who are guilty because of their sin or worried because of what's going to happen in the future. Um, always tired and stressed out. And some of these guys, too. These guys that I talk to uh, just feel like they're not respected or listened to and it causes problems. Uh, financial difficulties, things in their work because of COVID-19 and how they're not sure what things are going to be in the future for their businesses and how they're going to take care of their families. And they're worried about that and um, feeling like what's going to happen, what's, what's in the future for them. I think you're probably some of your high school students might be feeling that way too. Yeah, I, I as a teacher, I have to plan out all of my lessons, my curriculum, and having to do online school is like throwing a big wrench into all that hard work that I do in preparing for my classes. So I can I can relate definitely to that kind of emotion. And, and we have a whole bunch of people in the United States that are what they call preppers. You know, they take all the things that. They think that they need for the future if the world starts falling apart and they stockpile it and they have these bunkers like this one here and, and they're just preparing for the worst. And I want us to be very uh, clear that everyone is asking the same question. They really are deep in their heart. And that question is, in the middle of wars, in the middle of everything that's going on, is there hope? Yeah, and the question is not, do I have to buy a house in the backyard so I can build a bunker in, in the back? <laughs> That's not it. The, the heart of the issue is, do I have something I can hold on to um, when things are going this way all around? So, and where do we go? Where do we go to see where hope comes from? Where do we go for our hope? I mean, it's not Nostradamus, or we don't hopefully get the, uh, the fortune cookie that has the right <laughs> thing, or any kind of a, you know, the spiritist or card readers or things where do we go where do we where's our heart that we know deep inside for sure that we know where hope lies well we go to the scripture we go to the bible and the bible is very clear about what hope is and so i think we need to start off by uh kind of defining what biblical hope is because biblical hope is different than hope of the world or what you might think hope is yeah that's right so um, we have to understand that when the Bible says hope it's not what most people mean as hope um, the way the world uses hope is kind of like oh I, I hope that there's gonna be uh, salted popcorn in the movie theater when we get there and that mm. it didn't run out mm -hmm. or I hope that um, when I go outside, it won't be too cold and I have to go back inside the home or something. Yeah, so it's not a wish or a desire or a want. I hope it rains today because it hasn't rained for a long time. Or I hope I get a good grade on my exam. Or I hope that um, COVID-19 will go away. So those types of things. That is not hope. That's not biblical hope. And so it's based on something that is not changeable. And therefore, because it's not changeable, we put our heart there and we have hope because we know that what we're hoping and what we're looking forward to is a surety. About the definition uh, that we're going to look at uh, in the scripture, this is just kind of a synopsis of it. It's the, the cherish and desire with anticipation, desire with expectation of attainment of something that will be assured it's not like your wish upon a star or a happy birthday what did you wish for or you know we're blowing out the dandelion no there's a biblical hope that comes from the scripture and it is important to understand that it's based upon what the bible tells us hope is yeah and um just the very fact that hope comes um, from the scriptures um, can give us confidence that it's not a hope that is wishy-washy. It's, it's something that does not change, and it's firm. And that right there is the difference between the hope that the world has to give and the hope that Christ has to give in the Scriptures. So hope, then, when we talk about hope, we're talking about something that is true, that's factual, that's promised by God, and will come to pass without any doubt because it's based on God and his word and the truthfulness and the faithfulness of God himself. So let's look at the scripture. 
in definitions of where, where we get the definition of biblical hope. And the first uh, verse that we want to cover is Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to uh, have Nate read from verses 17 all the way to verse 20. Sure, so let's take a look now that we know the biblical definition of hope, how it's used in these passages. Hebrews 6, 17 to 20, in the same way God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor for or of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters uh, within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. So, this passage obviously makes it so very clear that hope is based on what God has done. The two things that is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 6 is that he made an oath. He promised something, so that's God's word. So God's word is there. It's true. It's not changing. It's not something that you hope will happen or won't have, uh, you know, not sure if it's going to happen. And the very fact, not only is his word there, but he says he's never going to lie. So he doesn't say something that's not going to come true. So therefore, hope comes from the, the, the word that God says and his trustworthiness. That's right. And so uh, the hope that the world has might say something like, oh, I hope it will get better. Whereas the Christian that has this kind of hope says, I know for a fact it will get better on the basis of God's character and the oath that he makes. It's, and I like when it says it's the anchor of our soul. Hope is our anchor. It's not something that's flimsy. It's not something that's lightweight. It's not something that's movable or shakable. It's an anchor. It is sure. It is steadfast. And in 1 Peter 1, uh, 1, Peter 1 3 to 4, it, it, it's alive. It's something that is with us that is living and, and, and it's something that we can... Uh, know that it's not going to go away. So can you read us 1 Timothy? Sure. Or uh, 1 Peter. Not 1 Peter? 1 Peter 1, 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I love these words. I mean, he used words like imperishable, undefiled, uh, will not fade away, is reserved. These are words of assure, assurity. So, for us, in the definition that we're getting from the scripture is that it's not that I wish something would happen. It's I know that will happen, and I cannot wait. I am waiting anticip with anticipation, expectancy for that thing to be accomplished, what God said would be accomplished. So, begin to identify, or at least hold up in your mind, the things that are causing insecurity. In your life right now. Now is a great time to just start to take inventory of the things in your life that might be causing you to feel shaky or stirred or not secure. Um, and then also begin to realize just through the passages we read and are going to read that our loving Heavenly Father who provides for us, who protects us, wants us to feel an overwhelming sense of security because we are in Him. And it says it's protected. It's reserved by the power of God through faith. Now, who is more powerful than God? Yeah, Nobody. And so the very fact that he preserves what he's promised for us by his own power means that anything else that comes cannot take that away. It's an inheritance that's for sure, and that salvation is given to us, no matter how you might feel how you are during the day. 
I mean, maybe you feel like you're sinful and, uh, you know, that these promises aren't really for you because you don't feel like uh, maybe sometimes we feel far away from God. But I love the verse that says, now unto him. It's all based in Jesus, who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. Meaning that this, this, uh, our relationship in salvation through God for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time is based upon the very fact that he's given us a right standing before God that will never be taken away and that our hope lies in him. Uh, in preparation for um, just this sermon, I was looking up some quotes uh, just about what hope is, and hope actually is remarkably similar to faith. In fact, we're going to talk more about just the similarities between the two things, but I got a quote from John Piper that says, when faith in God looks to the future, it's hope. When hope rests in God's word, that is faith. Mm. And so you see the relation between those two things. And God wants us to be people of strong faith. And when we cast that faith to the future, um, we can know that it's going to happen. We can have that certainty. And that attitude affects everything about the way we see the future. So it's an anticipation of what we believe in our heart through faith will be accomplished. Absolutely. And it's linked to the gospel. If you don't know the Lord based upon what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, his coming, we celebrate at Christmas, his, his forging that, that righteousness and obedience to uh, every law and not sinning, then willingly going to the cross, taking all of our sin upon him, and then giving his righteousness to us, so therefore, now we have this perfect right standing before God that will never go away, buried in the, in the ground, and on the third day, rising again to giving us that living hope. Hope is just completely linked to the gospel and what he has done for us. And so in, first, uh, in Colossians 1.35, it talks about how it is so linked and you'll be my uh, Bible reader. I guess today. I'm the guy. You're, you're the I guy. guess I'm <laughs> Colossians 1 3 to 5. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. It's also important to note that at the beginning of these letters, it seems like the authors want to just interject hope. Like, right. It's away. like the first chapters of almost everything that we read. That's Every right. Every epistle. Yeah, yeah, just, okay, go okay. ahead. Praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, just like what we were talking about, and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up, where? For you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. So it's laid up for us. Obviously, this world is not everything that God has promised for us. And I tell you, I still struggle, we all struggle, and we're struggling not with just things internally in our own self, as we talked about last week, but externally, um, am I going to keep my job? Does COVID going to like just totally flare up again? All, or all these other pressures that are coming in from outside of us, and yet we are sure for the future because we're right with God, and we have that because of the gospel. And everyone else around the world is not like that. And matter of fact, when you look around the world, it's tip the typical world people, uh, people of the world, they try to invent something to hope into. Uh, they, they don't have that assurity because they're outside of a relationship with God, and yet they, they try to fabricate it. It's part of trying to... Um, we're built to be able to hope into something, and so now the world is is doing everything they possibly can. Most people do it through religion, uh, like uh, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Islam, all these different. Some of them are thinking about this new new age kind of reality and, and about what uh, you know, mysticism and things. But there, something is drawing them to try to have hope into something. And unfortunately, because it's not the assurity of God's word and his faithfulness, they will never find it. It really makes me sad, like I said, how it's just 
the distinguishing factor between biblical Christianity and any other religion or system out there. Because any system in the world that is apart from Christ says, I hope I'll be good enough. I hope I'll be good enough. Whereas Christians say, I have hope because Christ is good enough for me. And most of the time, their reliance is on themselves, their own in, 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 ingenuity, uh, their own efforts, their own uh, eff, uh, picking themselves up by the bootstraps. Ingenuity is what I was saying. Tr trying to think of things that would better themselves, self-help things. And I, there's no hope in that. There's not. And I love what Job says. Job's uh, talk, uh, teaching on this is, is just one of the, the best things that you can, you can read. And so let's read Job chapter 8. Let's do it. 11 through 15. <laughs> go Bible read. All right, here we go. Job 8, 11 to 15. Can papyrus grow tall where there is no marsh? Can reeds thrive without water? While still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly than the grass. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes the hope of the godless flower. What he trusts in is fragile. What he relies on is a spider's web. He leans on his web, but it gives way. He clings to it, but it just does not hold. Do you see how he's just poetically saying, okay, godless people, people who are not depending on God, God's word, his faithfulness, and the, uh, the trustworthiness of who God is, the gospel itself, relying their hope on those things that are imperishable, are like leaning on a spider's web, hoping that that would hold. I mean, that just, that gets to me. And then in verse 8, For what hope has the godless when he is cut off, when God takes away his life? Oh, so here is part of the definition, is that hope, as we look forward to something happening in the future, is what God is uh, telling us is the final uh, end of our life, which means there is no end. We're, yes, we're mortal, we'll, 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 we'll die, everyone dies, but we will live because we, have been, we will be raised again. So the fact that God will cut those others off because of that lack of faith. Proverbs 10, I'll read this one, 28 says, The hope of the righteous shall be gladness but the hope of the wicked will perish. End. Boom. Nothing there because they're hoping, they're grabbing on. It's like grabbing onto something. And when they grab onto it, Job says it's great. It's this spider web. They just can't hold on to anything. So begin to, like I said, analyze these things in your life. And you're going to begin to notice a pattern if you don't believe in Jesus, that anxiety can come through the house of your life from any direction, right? Because you have no fortress, you have no security. Um, but if you're a believer in Jesus, right, we have this strong hope, right, this security of a known future. And the things that we might feel anxious about when we start to think about hope in this light, we're going to start to realize how silly it is to truly be filled with anxiety when, when peace is just one prayer away. And the futility of someone who does not have that eternal perspective hope in God brings them to live for themselves for the here and now. And they, uh, they don't look forward. That's why you... We have like, oh, I like this this guy, this, what's his name? Uh, oh my goodness, help me out, Nate. Uh, <laughs> Diogenes. Diogenes of Sinon. And he, he's the father of cynicism. And he's, this is one of his quotes. I rejoice in the sport in my youth. Long enough beneath the earth, then I shall lie. Bereaf of life. Voiceless as a stone, and I shall leave the sunlight, which I love, to see no more. Good man, thought I, there shall see no more in death. 
That's well, depressing. that's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year, everyone. So, people who do not know what is in store and do not have that eternal perspective with God, they say, I'm going to live my life now. Eat, drink, and be merry now, for tomorrow we die. And that is even in some of the most religious um, perspectives, um, that mindset is still there. Yeah. Yeah. Without God, without Christ, there really is no hope for the future. And in Romans 8, 23, the Bible tells us that we groan. And, but yet, we, in the middle of our groaning, and the world groaning, and everything of all creation, waiting for that anticipation of hope that things would be completely, totally made new and right uh, before the Lord, we as Christians have hope. So let's read Romans 8. Romans 8, 23, not only so... Uh, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Mm, who hopes for what he already has, right? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called in accordance to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, to be like Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And I love this verse. And those he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, guaranteed, he will also glorify. So everyone that God justifies will make it to be glorified. There is no breaking of the, the chain, the line of what God is doing in somebody's life. Even those things that seem to be bad in our lives, that seem to be, why is that even there? Or why am I going through this? All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. And our hope is, is cemented in God's trustworthiness. So when he saved us, not from any effort of ourselves, but by his grace and by his mercy, what Christ has done for us, nothing that we do to deserve it, he justified us. He imputed Jesus' just, uh, just right standing in us so that we would be his, and we are in the process of working that, that really reality of who we are inside, outwardly, in our actions. But eventually, we will be just like him. We will be glorified. Now, this is extremely, extremely important um, because we need to know the certainty of our salvation. Last time, um, when we were talking before, we were talking about the assurance of salvation on the basis of, is God changing my life are these observable differences that can only come through the ministry of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. So that's kind of a way that we see if, if we are being changed inwardly. But there is another part about the assurance of salvation, which is, is God going to keep me in? Can I lose my salvation? Mm. And the Reformers and the Puritans, the Christians of old, have used Romans 8.30 as what we would call the golden chain, mm. which means that once he predestines you and he calls you, he justifies you, your salvation is secure. You cannot lose your salvation. Mm. And that is a guaranteed glory that God has signed with his own blood through his son Jesus. So our hope is the anchor of our soul. It's anchored, and it's anchored as a guarantee in God and his trustworthiness. He will never lie, and his word to us, which will never be broken. And it's also, it's promised us and made a reality to us because of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And he assists us to help us understand the fulfillment of that hope as we're grabbing on to God uh, supernaturally as we intercess with God through the Holy Spirit. So, 
This is all basically a, uh, a long understanding definition of what hope is from the scripture. And it gives us a biblical hope, not a hope of the world. We're talking about something that's a fact, that's the component of salvation, and it's a final element of our hope will be seen the day that we will be glorified with him. And that is our entering into the eternal life in the perfection that God has promised us that will not uh, be faltered or will not stop. It, we will be in, he, whoever, he started this great work in us and he will complete it. And that's what we're headed to. And this is what we base our hope in. So before we continue, ask yourself this question. Do you groan inwardly? Is that a regular part of your relationship with God? Do you just, sometimes you just stare off into the distance and go, Lord, just come. Mm. Just, can you just get rid of all of this sin? And can you just get rid of this body that I, mm -hmm. of flesh that I struggle with? Can I just finally be with you with nothing in between of us in this fullest extent? And then you can answer uh, answer this question to yourself and go, one day, hmm. a certain glorious day that is promised to me. And so we groan with a certainty of knowing that we will be in completion with the one that we love. So that is basically where we get the definition of what hope is. Uh, there's much more, but I do want to talk about the components of what hope really is. The definition, but we can break it up into different uh, kind of components of what hope hope is. And so there's seven of them. We're going to go quickly. And so I'd like for us to talk about these uh, features that come from the scripture of our hope. And the first one is our hope. Obviously, it comes comes from God, and our hope comes from uh, it's an absolutely essential uh, uh, understanding that you have to get is that hope is not something that you generate within yourself. Biblical hope is not. It's not, um, it, it comes from God, and it's something that comes from outside of us. It's not something that we produce from the inside. The Spirit of God uh, makes it real for us, that is, it's objective, and it's not subjective. It's, it's not something that we muster up from within us. It is something that we tap into that comes from God. So it's not stir yourself up, and we're going to talk in a more practical way. I'm excited to do that, actually. It's not stir yourself up and try to wind yourself up like some kind of a toy um, and, and get excited. That, that, that's not it. That has no substance, right? So we need to look at the substance of our hope, and that source is not from ourselves, it's from God. So God's the source of our hope, and our, as Christians, we are dealing with an objective hope outside of us, given to us by God. And that is the only one that makes sense, since we cannot control our future. Um, we can make plans. We can do things that make things, I mean, we can study, get degrees, and we can do things hoping, in the sense that the world uses hope, that things will go the way that we plan. But because we cannot control our future, how can we have a biblical hope if it's coming from us? So it comes directly from God. And so we also need to understand that someone might say, well, okay, God is my hope, and God has provided this hope, but what if I goof it up? God gives me this hope, and, and he, he, it's a gift. He gives it to me, and now what if I just don't, don't do anything with it? And I, and I mess it up, and I, and I falter in my hope. Um, I don't measure up personally to be able to continue to live in the hope that God has given me. And this is what comes from number two. Our hope not only comes from God, but our hope is a gift of grace. And the whole aspect of our salvation is by grace. 
And so God gives us a hope that's based upon his uh, favor to us that we do not deserve. And so first, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 16 says this. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and the God, uh, and God the Father who has loved us and who has given us eternal comfort, wow, and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Wow. So hope right there in the middle, by grace, will comfort and strengthen our hearts. And we don't have to be concerned about always producing this kind of thing. This is the point. So the first point, it comes from God. And the second point, it's not something that we work for. It's something that God gives us by grace. And the third point, our hope is defined by the Scripture. And the scripture is so close, uh, so, so cool in the sense that hope comes from God. It's granted by grace to an undeserving sinner like me and you through salvation. And it is enriched and understood by the very scripture that he has given to us so that we can trust in. And if you want to understand your hope, if you want to get a grasp on it, uh, you go to the word of God like we have this morning and look up where hope comes from and all the elements of hope and you will learn a lot more about what hope is like in Romans 15 Romans 15 4 for everything that was written in the past was to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope oh so why was the scriptures given to us why were the things written down in the past and brought to us so that we can hold it in our hands? It's to teach us. And? It's to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement by them as a tool, we could have hope. We can have it. Yeah. So it goes back to the very beginning of what we were saying, the definition of hope is, and that's the trustworthiness of God and his word. He doesn't lie. And he wrote things down that are promises that are very specific and reasonable for us to understand. And so that we might hold in our hand the word of God and say, he's promised me this. It's a sure thing because it comes from God. It is a promise. And now I can, uh, if I don't see it, I can wait expectingly uh, with anticipation to see the fulfillment of what he said he would do. Like, what does the scriptures have to say? It says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, the things prepared for those who love him. And the more that we glimpse and we understand what God has prepared for us in the new earth and, and a greater relationship with him and glorified imperishable bodies and just the, the triumph of the gospel and the exaltation of Christ, all of a sudden you'll start to notice that all of your anxieties, all, all, all of that pessimism, mm. it's just all of a sudden it's just being eclipsed just by this brilliant light of God's prepared future for his people. Mm. Very practical. Yeah, and fourthly, it, it, this is something that is the whole basis of our faith, that our hope is secured by Christ's resurrection from the dead. He did rise from the dead. Amen. And the scripture says, if he did not rise from the dead our hope is our we are in everything that we're doing is for naught. it's in vain but we know somebody do you know somebody who died and came back to life again technically yes i yes, suppose that I we do, do. <laughs> we talk with him we spend time with him we are assured because of our relationship with god through jesus that he is a living back from the dead man who we relate to and hebrews tells us that we can relate to him as our as our brother and our high priest i like what first peter says first peter 1 3 and 4 you want to read that blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Whatever happens to Jesus happens to us. And that 
will uh, imprint on your heart a hope because this is a promise. If Jesus was raised from the dead, he will also raise us. And so our hope is relying on that. And he came back from the dead, and it's recorded that over 500 people saw him and walked with them, they talked with them, they ate with him, and they touched him, they saw his scars. The scripture makes it really clear that this is the probably the most important um, event that's ever happened is the resurrection of Christ, and this is where I hope lies. I, as a historian, I love this. It's it's our future hope is sealed with a past event. When you look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is the stamp, it is the seal that we can look to and draw forth our hope. Now, this is something that really spoke to me, is I heard it said that hope is like a reservoir of emotional strength. It's like a, a storehouse. It's like a storage that you just go to the storage, you open the door, and you get hope. When you feel mm -hmm. you're, you're emotionally suppressed, when you feel so weighted and burdened, and you know exactly where to go. Go to the scriptures. What does the truth say? Is your future sealed? And just begin to fill your mind, chiefly with what Christ has done for you in being raised from the dead and sealing your future. God has merged our destinies with his. So whatever happens, just like what my dad was saying, Whatever happens with Christ, happens with us. Is Christ a conqueror? Oh yes. And we are conquerors too. Mm -hmm. Do you see where we can draw that strength? Has Christ conquered sin? Does he have the power mm -hmm. over sin? Or does sin have dominion over you? I don't think so. Why? Because we have been severed from sin and we have been merged with Christ. Mm -hmm. That gives me hope. And that's where we can all get it from. Okay, so not only his resurrection, but hope is established in us by the Holy Spirit. There's the connecting point. Emmanuel, God with us, living in us, the Holy Spirit filling us, us yielding ourselves to the control of the Spirit in our life will help us not hold on to the things that we should not be hoping in. And when we walk in the Spirit, we hold on to the things that God has asked us to hold on to, and then our hope is just come not only understood, but it's realized that brings us that joy in our hearts because we are living for Him. Our hope is not in a new car, in a new house, <laughs> in a new girlfriend or boyfriend, or our hope is not in these things that the world will hold on to. I hope I get a better job. I hope that this thing's get. But when the Spirit of God comes in our hearts, it gives us this hope that fills us in such a way that we have this un undescribable joy and peace because we're hoping into things that God has got for us and not what the world offers. So in Romans 15 uh, verse 13 may the God of hope the God of what? The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Do you trust in him? Mm -hmm. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, mm. this is a fountain of hope. Just go underneath of this waterfall of, of just <laughs> grace and just be saturated with the promises of God and let the Holy Spirit, that, that comforter, give us that peace, give us that hope that he so freely wants to give to his people. Now listen, I, I just want to be really practical right now. Is Are you listening to the sermon of your circumstances? Are you looking at your circumstances? Or, oh, it looks like this is failing me, and this is going down, and I'm not going to, and I don't have the power, I don't have the... Mm. Or are you listening to the sermon of your Savior? Mm. Because he gave you power, he gave you hope, and he wants you to draw from that. So, in my opinion, I, I don't think that in the Christian life there should be any self-pity. Mm. Oh, look at me, look at my circumstances, mm -hmm. I'm just so... Oh, me, woe is me, I can't, I can't. That person is demonstrating a faulty focus. They're not focusing on Christ 
and the promises and the power he gives, they're focusing on their own weakness, mm -hmm. they're focusing on their circumstances that seem to not be going their way, and God does not want us to live in that way. He wants us to be filled with hope. Yeah. And being controlled and empowered by the Holy Spirit is the only way. Get yourself out of the picture and let, let the Spirit uh, control you. And then you will see this joy and this peace that comes uh, from the right perspective, right values uh, that he brings up from the inside out. And then we have the hope. Our hope is confirmed through trials. Now, Satan wants us to doubt God. And we are going through a lot of trials. And most people do go through. I don't know anybody that's not going through something. And God uses those things in our lives so that we might grab onto him instead of the spider webs. Grab onto God and bring uh, our, uh, our life underneath the fact that we need him. And without trials in our lives, sometimes it's hard to picture that we need God. And God brings those things to us so that we might hold on to him. And Holding on to him brings hope. So if you have trials, you run to God because, of God, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting here. Now, this is not anything like what you are saying earlier. This is the fact that we are being honest with God with things that are going on that he allows in our life. And when we do that, we run to him, and then we have hope because we are grabbing on to him. Let me help you guys um, and teach you something that I have found so helpful and instrumental in my life. And uh, I, I, I looked through the sermon and doesn't have the verse, but quickly go with me to Psalm uh, 42, mm -hmm. Psalm chapter 42, make your way there now. And as you're making your way there now, the Psalms is just completely filled with God, my situation, my situation, my situation. Mm. But how does it end? God, your, your security, your, I trust in thee, my heart is fixed mm. on you. So, in Psalm 42, um, there's two verses, it's re repeated, it's a refrain. Um, I'll just read verse 5. It says, Why art thou cast down, my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Mm. I have a question for you. Do you preach to yourself? Do you preach to yourself? Do you say to your soul, why soul? Why are you downcast mm -hmm. in me? <laughs> Why are you downcast, yeah. right? Why are you disquieted? Hope in God. Mm -hmm. And the world out there that seeks to stir themselves up based upon spider webs, they don't have this kind of security. Mm -hmm. So you need to preach to yourself. You need to say, hope in God. I will praise his name. I will get out of this situation mm -hmm. and he will deliver me. You go through enough trials in your life, and you will long for heaven. You will long for him. That's right. And Paul, in, in, the, in, in the scripture, I mean, the guy went through so much. And because of that, I believe, it has brought him closer and closer to the Lord. And I think that those things that when we start to grumble in our hearts because of the rough times that we go to, we could change that perspective instantly when we realize that like in James 1 where it talks about trials that they're there for us to be more and more um, Christ-like but also to depend more and more on him. It makes me think about Paul in prison when he's writing to the Philippians or when he's writing to the other churches does he say oh I'm in prison oh please please help me pity me please I feel so no he's the guy with the most joy yeah. And he has so much hope, and that hope sustains him, and it's making people like scratch their head and going, why is this man so filled with hope despite his circumstances being so against him? It's because he has a God that is so for him. Mm. And that right there, it just, it, it testifies against a hopeless world. Yeah. And so please look at trials and struggles in your life as opportunities to grab onto God, which produces more faith, more hope, more intimacy with him. I want to tell you a little story. A number of years ago, in a mental institution, 
outside of Boston in the United States, a little girl named Little Annie was locked in a dungeon, and the dungeon was the only place, said the doctors, for her to, who were hopelessly insane. So little Annie was this girl, and she was completely and totally insane. And in little Annie's case, they, they uh, saw no hope for her. She was uh, consigned to living, uh, a, a living death in a small room like a cage, which received little light and had less hope. About that time, an elderly nurse was nearing retirement, and she felt that there was hope for all of God's children, even little Annie. So she started talking to her and taking her lunch and going to the dungeon area where they kept her. Um, and little Annie was in totally unresponsive to this, this nurse. And she felt perhaps she would communicate some love and hope to give to this little girl. And in many ways, little Annie was like an animal. Sometimes on occasion, she would violently attack the nurse. Uh, other times she would act like she wasn't even in the room, in the corner, no response whatsoever. And one day the elderly nurse brought some brownies to little Annie and inside of her room that was like a cage. Little Annie gave no hint she knew that there was anything in the room, but when the nurse returned the next day, the brownies were gone. And from that time, the nurse would bring brownies to little Annie every Thursday and visit her. Soon after, the doctors in the institution noticed a huge change in little Annie. After a period of time, they decided to move little Annie upstairs out of her room. Finally, the day came that the hopeless case of little Annie, she was returned to her home. And little Annie did not wish to leave. She chose to stay in the hospital, the insane hospital, so that she could care and look and to teach and to help all the other people that were in that hospital, that mental insanity hospital, that had little hope. And one day, little Annie became a woman, and she is known as Ann, Ann Sullivan. And she's the one that helped Helen Keller come out of her uh, complete isolation, because Helen Keller couldn't speak or see or hear or do anything. And she was the one that helped bring Helen Keller back Praise the Lord. And so both of them, God-loving, wonderful women. And Helen Keller says, without, without vision, people perish. And so I really, and he, she wasn't talking about the vision of her eyes. <laughs> she was talking about what to look forward to, what to hold on to, what to hope in. And I believe that the scripture makes it very, very clear that when we have hope, we come out of trials, and we come out stronger because we look forward to God and His Word and what He says, and God meets us where we're at. Now, the last, our hope is fulfilled in Christ's return. He's coming back, and we are to look up for Him, and we are to hope in him and his return to take us home. So would you read? <laughs> Titus 2, 12 to 14. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us. Are you and looking towards the eastern sky, <laughs> expecting each day that our Lord will return, um, even if he doesn't come in our lifetime, we can still look forward to seeing him, and that will 
will sharpen the sword of your hope more than anything else. The longing to see our Savior. Uh, I cannot wait. I want to, uh, like Thomas, uh, look at his scars and say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> when I go to him, I don't know, like the song, I have no idea what I'm going to do. You know, am I going to sit or going to kneel? I'm going to whatever, sing, or am I going to just sit there? I don't know. But I do know I'll look for him and his scars, and I will thank him and praise him. And I'm looking forward to that day. Yeah. Hope is an extremely powerful thing that it just burdens my heart to see so many Christian people act so hopeless. Mm. It, there's just no reason for that. Take up your strength. Preach to your heart. Mm -hmm. You have just a, a, a reservoir, like I said, of reasons to have strength in this present life. And that's because you know exactly what the Lord is going to do. He's going to come again. He's going to take you home into a place that he has been preparing for you. We're getting older. I'm getting grayer. Um, one day, we all, we all will pass. Um, and he, whether he comes while I'm alive or I go see him after my death, our, our hope should be uh, solely based on seeing our Savior. Um, there's this last story that I like to talk about when, when I give this, this message. It's this elderly woman. You see her on the screen. I don't know if you can see her. Yeah, you can maybe. And she had a ter terminal illness. And her pastor went to go to her home to pray for her and to ask her about her final wishes. And she told him about the songs that she wanted to sing at the funeral, that they could sing at the funeral, the scriptures that she wanted read at her funeral. And all of a sudden she remembered this one thing. Oh, there's one more thing, pastor. And the pastor said, what is it? And he says, this is very, very important, the woman said. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. Yeah, the fork in her right hand. The, the pastor stood looking at the woman, not knowing quite what she was saying. And he says, can you explain to me? And she says, in all my years of attending churches and social and potluck dinners at the churches, when the dishes of the main course were being cleared, someone would inevitably lean over and say, Keep your fork. It was the favorite part of the meal was about to come, like a velvet chocolate cake or a deep dish apple pie. So when people see me in my casket after I've gone <laughs> and a fork in my right hand and they ask, what is the fork for? I want everyone to say, keep your fork for the best is yet to come. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Isn't that great? I, I, it's a great thing. Yeah. It's a perspective of hope that we have that's outside of this world that we live in. And so I think we should pray, and I'm going to pray uh, a specific prayer from Psalms 146, which is a song, but it's also a pray. prayer. It says this. Let's pray together. How blessed how wonderful or how, how happy is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Lord, this is our prayer, that when we see you uh, and we look to you, that we will, even though we can't reach out and touch you now, that our happiness and our joy and our blessing comes from the hope that we have in you because of what you have done for us. And I pray that it produces great joy in every one of our members of our church and that we would uh, be defended against Satan's attacks and that we would glory in the, the fact that the Holy Spirit is helping us being separated from the world and that we would be secure because Jesus rose again from the dead and our hope is reasonable. It comes from the understanding of the scripture, which is granted to us as a gift by God himself. And we pray, Lord, that we would be trusting in who you are, God.
promises that you've given us and the very fact that you are faithful to everything that you said. And that's where our hope lies. Help us grab on to you and that hope we pray in this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much you for are very joining us awesome. again. We appreciate it. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to have you back, but oh. we do appreciate the fact that you, <laughs> that you helped us. We pray you guys have a great uh, New Year's time and that you get a good rest um, and be hopeful. Thank you very much.